you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. On today's episode, I take a short trip across the Peak District to the Lancashire town of Accrington to speak with author and researcher Craig Bryant. With two books under his belt, Craig has been collecting stories from towns and villages around the Ribble Valley and beyond. We look into the infamous case of the Pendle Witch Trials and the strange lights that have been seen above Pendle Hill throughout the centuries, UFOs that have been spotted over and around Morecambe Bay, ghostly monks, shadow people, and even a haunted ice cream shop. It's always great to cover an area we've yet to investigate in full, and a big thank you to Craig for being our guide around this particularly spooky area. As always, before we get there though, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by going to patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters or by clicking the link in the show notes. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, early releases, and bonus content. You can also find Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we're also on LinkedIn. Don't forget you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube as well. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, updates, and merchandise. A big thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let Craig Bryant be our guide as we look out for ghosts, witches, and UFOs. On this episode of Mysteries and Monsters, I'm joined by author, researcher, and podcaster, Craig Bryant. With two books under his belt, Craig has researched the paranormal occurrences in the area surrounding his base in the Ribble Valley of Lancashire. Craig, welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted. You're somebody I've been wanting to uh, pick their paranormal brains about for quite a while, Craig, so I'm delighted to finally get a chance to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honoured that, uh, that you've tracked me down and, and asked me to be a guest, yeah? Absolutely. Doing our bit for Yorkshire and Lancashire relations, I feel. <laughs> All the cricket teams. <laughs> All the football teams. All the football teams. <laughs> Absolutely. Craig, you're one of those people who's recently sort of published yourself into the, the paranormal world with your, your, your two books coming out in sort of the last three or four years. Mm. And obviously you're one of those people, I think, that you seem to have had a connection with the paranormal for a very long time because I've heard you speak that uh, it was your grandfather who used to regale you with spooky stories as a young child that kind of got you bitten by the paranormal bug. Yeah. I mean, obviously this is going back quite a few decades now um, to when I was a... Uh to when I was a young lad, probably only about sort of six, seven, eight years of age. Um, I used to spend quite a lot of time at my uh, maternal grandparents' house. Um, and it was your typical two up, two down Lancashire, you know, industrial era terraced house. And in in the back room, which, um, you know, they had, they had two rooms downstairs, they had a, a front parlour, um, which was the posh room that you weren't, certainly at my age then, I wasn't allowed in there because all the posh crockery and everything were in, were in cabinets in there. <laughs> uh, but the, um, the back room really was, was where everything happened in the house. And there was a range, one of the old, big old cast iron ranges mm. that, you know, was, was, had been in the house for, for many, many years. And I used to sit in front of that um, in the evening with my granddad. My grandma would be off, you know, cooking, doing whatever. But I used to sit in front of the cast iron range with, with my granddad and he used to tell me stories. Um, and there were a mixture of ghost stories, which I suppose really now when I look back at it, it was quite quite frightening really for a, you know, a young lad of that age. But it, it sort of fueled, I think, my, you know, my imagination to a certain degree. And it, it got me interested very much in local history, local legends that he used to tell me about. He used to live very close to the Leeds Liverpool Canal. Mm. The place where, where he lived was just on the outskirts of the town where I grew up, actually, which uh, which was Accrington. But it, it was a small village and it was actually called Church. 
Um, and it was it was actually named after the big Norman church that had been built there, actually. It dated back to about the 1100s. Mm. And so the whole community had grown up around this this church, very, very famous church. Oliver Cromwell uh, called there and rang Peel rang the bells to you know to get all the the local people to 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 rally to his cause so it's got an awful lot of history to it but my granddad used to tell me lots and lots of of ghost stories used to tell me lots and lots of local legends especially about the canal um and little bits of snippets of family history as well uh, his side of the family were very much entwined with the Leeds Liverpool Canal. They were they were bargemen. They all worked on the boats. Mm. So so there was a lot of sort of mixture of of ghost stories and, and local legends. And it and it was that really that sort of stayed with me ever since up until about three or four years ago when when I suddenly thought to myself, actually, you know, I've got so many stories. And over the years, I've spoken to so many people and I've had so many experiences myself um, over the years that it seemed a, a shame, really, not to sort of sit down and start writing these stories down. And before long, it soon became quite apparent that I had enough for a book. Mm. So I thought, you know, why not? Let's put it out as a book. Let's put it out on Amazon. Um, and I did that. And that's how it all started for me, really. I mean, I'm a big fan of local history. And local paranormal stories, Craig. And I think this seems to be something we've kind of lost sight of over the last 20 years or so. I don't know why. Maybe it's because we've gone through one of those slumps that sometimes happens in the world of the paranormal or the world of the weird. Because I remember, like you, we're probably very similar aged, Craig, in regards to the eras we grew up in. So for me, it's kind of something I have, I look back on sort of the 80s and, and sort of early 90s and there'd always be local history books or local ghost story books. And they all seemed to sort of disappear towards the end of the 90s, early noughties. They just vanished. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of that, to be honest with you, is, is the, for, for better or worse, it's, it's the birth of the internet. Mm. It's and it's the birth of dare I mention you know those those words most haunted. I think <laughs> I think it moved away from being something which I grew up with, which was intriguing and fascinating and an interesting subject, to being something which was more entertainment based. Mm. And I think that gave the paranormal, especially. A bad name, yeah. Rather than it being something that that people could sit down in front of an ice fire on a on a dark winter's evening with a good ghost book um, and read, you know, not only factual ghost stories, but but you know, even you know, sort of fictional ghost stories as well. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it's for me, it's vitally important that there are authors like yourself, Craig, out there collecting these stories from 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 smaller areas because with the yeah. greatest respect when people think of lancashire they automatically mm -hmm. think of some of the larger places obviously the county capital lancaster and then yeah. wherever people want to draw the border towards manchester is a different kettle of fish but then obviously yeah. you've got to, towns like burnley and blackburn mm. yeah it's it's a big old county is like uh, lancashire so it's for me i think often when you've got towns like accrington and clitheroe and Darwin and Nelson and places like that, that unless you follow football or you have family on your mm. side of the Pennines, a lot of these places, people just bypass them for better or worse, Craig. Yeah, yeah, they just, yeah, they basically just drive past the sign on the M6, I think, when the when they're passing through, you know. Mm. Well, no, you're right. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, Accrington, for instance, um, I lived there for the first 38 years of my life um, before I, I met met my wife and, and moved out to where I live now. Accrington, for instance, has got so many stories, so many ghost sightings, so many areas of, of paranormal activity. And the more you look into these stories, the more you speak to people, the more you speak to local people, um, the more stories, the more information you get. You're quite right. There are other towns as well, um, Blackburn, Burnley, Preston, Lancaster. You know, they've all got their own plethora of stories i think is probably the best way of putting it mm. and 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 yeah i mean you know there is so much material out there i mean i've i've written two books as you mentioned in in the introduction they are the, they are based very much um around two things really one is the town of accrington because as i say i, I grew up in that in that town i was uh, I was 38 when I moved out, so I I knew a lot of the, the stories and, and and a lot of the ghost stories um, 
growing up. Mm -hmm. But also as well, there are a lot of personal accounts in, in both books of other people's experiences, personal experiences that people that, that won't have been published anywhere else because they are very personal experiences. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, when I was getting evidence together for the book, getting stories together for the book, we were at a friend's house and she was a, uh, she is a friend of my wife's. Um, she's a teacher in, in the same, uh, my wife's teacher as well. And she just said to me, she said, how's, how's the book going? You know, how, how, how's the, how's the writing going? And I said, oh, it's, it's okay. You know, I've, I'm sort of, I was about halfway through at the time. And she said, well, you need to meet Helen. And there was somebody else there, and there was a lady called Helen. She said, come here, child, I'll introduce you to Helen. Mm. I've never met this woman before. Right? <laughs> and she told me about, she said, oh, I've got to tell you this story. She told me about a house that she lived in, in Leyland, near Preston, mm -hmm. which was haunted by the ghost of a little boy. And her daughter, um, when they first moved in, her daughter, who was quite young at the time, used to play with this invisible friend. And it only after, after a while did Helen start to see and glimpses at this little boy. And she told me all sorts of stuff about things that had gone on. And so there are stories like that in the book, which, you know, she'd never told anybody before. Yeah. And us just have that sort of face that, you know, <laughs> people trust and then um, will tell me. So it's because a lot of people are still quite sceptical about paranormal activity and, and, you know, UFOs and anything really which is unexplained and weird. Mm. And, and sometimes, you know, people do open themselves up you know, they can feel like perhaps they're going to be laughed at. They're going to, you know, they're going to be ridiculed for for saying, "Oh, well, actually, you know, I've got a ghost in my house, so I've seen a ghost." I think I think um, attitudes are changing, but I do think that some people can still be quite guarded. So it it was really interesting that the more people that I sort of spoke to, the more stories I was told, and. Mm. You know, some of them are, are, are really quite hair-raising. Again, I'll give you another example in the the first book I wrote, The Shadow Man of Accrington. Um, there was a lady who contacted, contacted me by email. And I remember when I read the email, my jaw was, was dropping further and further towards the floor because the things that she was telling me in the email were just incredible poltergeist activity that you would not believe. Um, and I, I rang her and then we had a chat about, about it, you know, and I, I must have been on the phone to her for a good couple of hours. Mm. And I can always tell when somebody's being genuine and I can always, and, you know, I can always work people out within a very short space of time, whether I'm meeting them face to face or, you know, whether I'm speaking to them um, on the phone or, or over the internet, whatever. And she just told me the most amazing story. And again, this is in the book, Shadow Man of Accrington, uh, about a house that she lived in, which had the most un unbelievable poltergeist activity. But she'd done some research into it, into the possible uh, reasons why there was all this really quite, some of it was quite frightening. You know, there were knives being thrown. There were doors being slammed so hard that the, the casings around the doors were breaking. Mm. And she did some research into what was what was in the area and she tied it into um coal mining disaster that had happened in the uh towards the back end of the um the 19th century so mm. late late 1890s thank you was and and the, the, the whole the, the area where she lived it was absolutely riddled underneath with um with the mine shafts and when this this Mind you, all the, the, you know, this disaster had happened. A lot of the shafts had collapsed and there were men and boys, unfortunately, trapped inside some of the shafts and they died. Mm. Oh, this was all linked into the, to the paranormal activity. It wasn't just her house, by, by the way. It was, she knew of at least half a dozen other houses on the same row. Again, they were sort of like, you know, old cottage type, um, stone built terraced houses that were all having similar sort of paranormal activity and she, she actually got a medium to come in and 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 sort of see what what she could find out she pinned it down to to what had happened at this this mining disaster and and again you know that story was was so amazing and yet she'd never really told anybody with the intent of it being printed obviously friends and family knew about the house where they lived um, but again it's just a good example of people opening up and, and being happy to to talk to you if you you know, if you're a genuine researcher, people will open up and talk to you about these sort of things. And and, and I think that's one of the joys actually of, of doing this sort of thing. I mean, obviously it takes up a lot of time. You you know 
yourself, you know, doing a, a podcast. I do my own podcast, do a lot of research. I also, you know, have a full-time job and a family. So, you know, it does take up a lot of your time. But I think it, it's when you speak to somebody like that and you get a story like that and you get the facts and you write it down and you read it back to yourself and you think, do you know what? All that hard work's been worth it because of this is a fantastic story and it needs to be told. Yeah, and it's one of those things as well, Craig, that you think how many other people in in the UK have stories like this and it's only the big ones that ever seem to make the, the press or, or get the attention. And when you're reading your books, as, as I was referring to, I love collections like this because we'd never have heard of these if you hadn't have decided to take the plunge and that, you know i would imagine there are several authors all around the uk who are collecting these yeah. wonderful first-hand encounters mm. from friends and family and building up these local paranormal histories as they were because yeah when you think about where you are and where i grew up very similar very industrial heartlands these were areas where tragedy was around the corner mm. every day for a lot of people be they working in cotton mills yeah. In the looms, down the pits. Yeah. Still works here in Sheffield Creek. Oh, These look very yeah. dangerous jobs. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, life was cheap. You know, labor yeah. was cheap. Life was cheap. Uh, we had cotton mills in, in, in this area. Um, I mean, there was actually a cotton mill in the village where I live at the moment. It's not there now. It was demolished in the early 1980s and there's now modern houses built on it. Mm. But there's a cotton mill called Victoria Mill. They had about 200 blues at one point it was it was a really big business and there's a lot of paranormal activity based around the sites of where that used to be again you know people just volunteering stories a couple of years ago actually just just before i finished writing the first book i was sat in a garden with a neighbor and we were just having a drink it was a nice lo lovely summer's evening and we were just chatting away and actually he's really into his local history and his local paranormal stuff and everything else hmm. uh, and I was just telling him, you know, about what, what was in the book and everything else. And his neighbour popped his head over um, over the wall. And he told me the story um, of, of when he was a, a child. Um, and they used to play up by where, where the, um, the weir, the, the weir is still there where the, where the cotton mill was situated. Uh, because it's a natural water course that runs through the centre of the village. So they dammed it and then turned it into a big um, sort of lodge where they used to hold the water and everything. For the, for the water wheel, for the, um, for the cotton mill when it was first built before they went to coal power. Mm. And there was a story of, um, of, of a guy that, that uh, that they actually found dead. His body was slumped over the sluice wheel. I found one morning by the workers going into the into the cotton mill. Um, and his ghost is apparently seen in the area quite a lot. And this neighbour popped his head over the wall and said, well, when I was six years of age or whatever age it was, he said, me and my mates were playing down by the weir and we saw that ghost. It came out of the trees towards us. And, and you know, he said, we all panicked and ran. And again, it's just little stories like that. This came from a source. If you knew this guy is a really nice bloke don't get me wrong but you would not think mm -hmm. that he would be the type to just volunteer a story like that because they would think it was totally out of character and i think for me as well because it i've i've traveled across the pennines many a time i remember being a lad getting on the train going through to manchester and going through some of these small towns on the outskirts when you come over the border approaching greater manchester craig yeah and you'd go through places like New Mills. And I always remember there was this enormous old building that had been there for, must have been there abandoned for decades. And when you look back at these places, and I'm not sure what it was like when you were a lad growing up, were they just, you know, all these old mills, had they just been abandoned and left to sort of rot? Because I was always amazed when I saw this building in New Mills because there was nothing near it. And it was, it was just derelict. It was like yeah. 10 stories high. And it was just falling to pieces. Yeah, I, I, I think I think when I, I mean I grew up in the seventies. I was I was born in the mid sixties, so I grew up in the seventies really, um, and then the early part of the eighties. Um, I mean, certainly the the cotton industry had, had suffered horrendously um, after the Second World War because of cheap cotton imports from uh, places like India and the Far East. Mm. A lot of um, a lot of the old factories were derelict. I mean, the main employer in Accrington actually used to make uh, weaving uh, looms. Um, it was a company called Howard and Buller, and that was the big employer in, in Accrington, and it was still 
won't say going strong, but it was still employing people up, up, up until probably about the sort of mid to late eighties. Mm. They used to export a lot of weaving machines, a lot of looms out to the Far East because you know we, even though we couldn't produce the, the cotton anymore, we were still very good at producing the machines. Mm. Um, and there's actually a place in South Manchester called Style Mill. It's down near um, down near the airport. Yep. My wife's a, a history teacher, by the way, so she's very much into all this sort of thing. Um, and Style Mill is is still a working cotton mill, and the machines are Howard and Bullard's. So it's quite interesting to go on from personal point of view to see them working because my dad, when he worked there, and my granddad, they, they used to work on. My dad used to design them in the drawing office, and my granddad used to build them on the shop floor. So you know, for me, that's quite that's quite interesting. But yeah, I mean, just going, just moving back into sort of you know the paranormal aspects of it all. I mean, you're right. There's so much history in these places, and there's so. A lot of the time there's been so much tragedy, there's been so many um, people have, have unfortunately lost their lives in industrial accidents, you know, that there is that imprint of that emotional um, energy, which I think is still in these places. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a rich place for, for paranormal activity, you know. And I also have theories about um, ley lines as well and, and various other, you know, factors that, that we can chat about um, later on, if you like, but about you know, why there are certain areas which seem to be more concentrated than others, you know. Penn Hill being an example, but not for the reason most people think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, it's probably a good point to start with because for me, I think, especially when it comes to incidents that happened up north in regards to those dark, dark days of, of these I mean, you look back at it and it's just absolutely balmy. Yeah. The Pendle Witches is, is a very infamous case for a variety of reasons. It's, it's one of those that seems to have really got famous over the last 20 years down to paranormal television and the entertainment yeah. aspect of it more than anything else. Yeah. Right? Whereas, as you touched on there about your wife being a history teacher, I love history primarily because often it makes me shake my head and just mm. thank God that I wasn't around in those eras because probably be one of the people being tried for yeah. <laughs> witchcraft. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Pendle Witch Trial of, of 1612 is, is one of those where when you look back at it, it's essentially a disagreement between two families, rumours, absolutely mind-blowingly stupid evidence, nonsensical confessions, torture, and we end up in a situation where was it... The 11 of them died, but I think 10 were hung and one died awaiting trial, didn't they? That's right. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it, the Pendle Witches is a, is an interesting story. I mean, I've, I've looked at, at before and after the, well, sorry, before the trial and during the trial. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, um, material out there. There's a lot of historical material out there. What most people don't realize actually is that there is only one contemporary record of, both before and during the trial. The investigations were done within this area, within the area of Pendle itself. It, 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 technically, it's called Pendle Forest. Or well, it's not a forest as in, you know, full of trees. It's just, they, they use the word forest to um, sort of describe an enclosure or enclosures, really. Uh, I mean, as you, know, as, as you said, we're going back to the 17th century. And a lot of the hunting rights and everything were actually owned by the Crown. Mm. And so forests were sort of like enclosed areas. So I've I've had a look at quite a few different books that, that have looked at different aspects of the evidence that, that we've got. There was a book written by a guy called Thomas Potts. And Thomas Potts was the clerk to the court um, at the Lancaster Assizes at Lancaster Castle, where the, the surviving Pendle witches, because you're quite right, one of them did die waiting for trial. Um, and if anybody's ever been to Lancaster Castle, you can actually have a look at the, the dungeons, the cellars where they were kept. Um, and it, you, you can quite understand how somebody who was in her 80s um, and infirm, uh, you know, before they even marched them the 50 odd miles from from. Pendle up to um, to Lancaster. Uh, you can quite understand how how you know the health would have, have suffered to such a degree 
believe that they could die before they they actually got to trial. So so yeah, you can you can actually see where where they were where they were held, and and of course you can also see um, the courts where they were tried uh, because it it was still a working court up until very recently. I think. Um, I think it closed during COVID, um, but then um, I think it's uh, it's reopened again, and, and they do still have some some trials up there. But yeah, just just going back to the records that that, that we have, it is a very one sided view of of both the investigations that were made by Roger Noel, who was the magistrate in the area prior to these people being charged with witchcraft, and then actually going up to Lancaster and being tried. Thomas Potts was has has made records of the evidence that was given uh, whilst they were being interrogated here in in Pendle near to where they lived, um, and then also the evidence that they gave when they were um, when they were actually uh, being examined and cross examined in the court up at Lancaster, and it's some of the um, some of the evidence which is recorded is is quite. Astonishing, um, you know the accusations and counter accusations made basically by the two families, the confessions of uh, actually bewitching uh, children who who later died, adults who later died, usually because of um, some sort of petty falling out over things like begging, or uh, in in one case. If I recall, it was uh, uh, Chatox, who, who was one of the matriarchs of, the, of, of one of the families. She'd been out begging with her granddaughter. She went to a local farm. She asked for some milk. She was told to clear off, get off the property. Mm. And she said she admitted to putting a curse on this farmer and the farmer later died. So it's, it's evi- you know, evidence like that. They, they admitted to all sorts of stuff. They even admitted to digging up bodies from um, graveyards and using them in spells. They admitted to um, forging packs with the devil. Quite a lot of times they would say that, the, you know, the devil would come to them in the guise of an animal. So sometimes it was a black dog. Sometimes it was um, a, a white hare. But these creatures would always speak to them. They'd, they'd always promise them that, you know, they would give them any desire that they wanted, providing they would give themselves over to, to the devil in, in return. They were they were admitting to, to wild accusations. By modern standards of wild accusations, they may well have believed them themselves. Mm-hmm. They may well have been coerced into saying these things. Um, again, it's very difficult to work out whether or not they voluntarily uh, admitted to these things or whether they were coerced because the account is, is obviously very pro prosecution very pro magistrate you know the magistrates asking these questions and and the replying in in such a manner as, as to admit to all these different things mm. what actually happened um, we'll never know you know whether there was torture involved um and or not i mean torture itself was not permitted during uh, the interrogation of witches under English law. Now, up in Scotland, it was completely different. Yes. And uh, and in fact, there are accounts of some quite horrendous bouts of torture, especially with, especially the Berwick trials. Yes. Um, you know, there's quite there's, there's some really quite graphic descriptions of how they uh, extracted confessions under English law. It was a little bit different. Torture wasn't allowed. However, people such as Matthew Hopkins, for instance, were very good at uh, using techniques which were not classed as torture. So, for instance, keeping people awake Mm. uh, indefinitely was not classed as torture. (laughs) Or walking them, as uh, you know, in inverted commas, walking them uh, up and down in a room, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, until they literally dropped, again, was not classed as torture. So... Uh, yeah, I did quite a bit of research on that actually, and looked at um, looked at the what these people were being accused of, what what they were admitting, and and some of them are quite wild accusations and confessions. And then you know when when we get up to the to the actual trial itself at Lancaster, bearing in mind that you know they've been kept in these horrible and squalid conditions for several months um, after they've been taken up to Lancaster, all apart from. The, the youngest, who was um, a little girl by the name of Jeanette Device, who had mysteriously not had to spend too much time 
in the cells, she had actually spent quite a bit of time living at the magistrate's house, um, Roger Noel, who lived at a place called Reed Hall near Paddyham, which is a, a small, well, small town really outside the village. It's a town near near to Burnley. Mm. And and she uh, she was the, you know, I mean, this this would never fly in a court of law these days, but she was the, um, the main prosecution witness against her entire family and a number of others. <laughs> And, you know, she had previously spent time living with the magistrate, living at, at his house, obviously living in the lap of luxury compared to the conditions that, that the peasants, the farmers, the, you know, the people who lived in the villages and, and the outlying areas around here lived in, you know, I mean, they were really living on the breadline mm. and they were extremely poor. And, and this little girl was obviously, you know, did Roger Noel see her and, and think, right, you know, she's she's malleable, I can, I can put words into her mouth, she's she's going to be, you know, my prosecution witness. Because, you know, people have got to remember that during this time, it was it was James I of England. Yeah. Uh, um, James VI of Scotland, he was absolutely obsessed with witchcraft. He saw witches around every corner. <laughs> he passed laws that basically... Um, uh, said that if if you weren't a church going Protestant and didn't go to church on a Sunday, then you were a witch. In fact, <laughs> and a lot of um, people who who believed in the Catholic faith at the time, who used to practice underground, as it were, um, a lot of them were were accused of witchcraft because they, they wouldn't admit to the faith because they were more frightened of of what would happen if if they admitted to the faith. And one of the uh, one of the most famous um, of the Pendle witches was uh, a lady by the name of Alice Nutter, mm. um, and she was actually the widow of a relatively well off. She was relatively well off. She had lands. She was the widow of um, a local yeoman farmer. And there are some schools thought that um, Roger Noel wanted, wanted her lands, in effect, oh. to get a lands offer. She was a practising Catholic by the looks of the evidence. And there was a meeting on, on Good Friday, which is referred to a, at a place called Malkin Tower, which it would seem was probably a, a, a sort of Catholic mass, um, which, which was obviously very much prohibited at the time. And so she, rather than sort of admit to anything really, didn't didn't incriminate herself at all. But then she offered no uh, no defence. Yeah. And uh she she was one of those that, that ended up unfortunately being being hanged. Um there is actually a rather wonderful uh, bronze statue on at the side of the road. And if if people have a look on uh on my website and also have a you know have a look in the book, uh, there are photographs of it. It, it was by a local uh, artist. It's a life size bronze statue near to the village of New Church, which mm -hmm. is sorry, not New Church, roughly. I I, I do apologise. New Church is where the churches where they allegedly dug up the bodies near the village of Ruffley, which is where um, Alice Nutter lived. Um, and it, it's it's a wonderful um, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it, it, it's a homage to, to her and to her situation and to the situation of all those people who were probably wrongly accused of witchcraft. I think a lot of them believed to a certain degree that they could heal people I think they were what we would now refer to as as wise women um, who used to, you know, people used to go to them for, for portions and healing portions and, you know, even things like love portions and all that sort of stuff. You know, they, they, they were sort of like the the people in the village that um, that used to make a living out of helping others who were, who were ill. And I think, you know, some of them did genuinely believe that they were, um, they were skilled in the arts of, of witchcraft is, is, is the wrong word. Probably, you know, country craft or country law, I think is probably the way to, to best describe it. And it, it just all got manipulated and, and blown up out of all proportion. And it was purely really because Roger Noel was a local magistrate and he wanted to ingratiate himself with James I, as did many of his magist um, you know, fellow magistrates, because they'd been specifically instructed by James I to find and convict and execute witches. Mm. It's it's a real mess. When I've looked into it and read about it, Craig, it just seems to be an unfortunate series of circumstances because you've got this issue between these two families who were clearly 
they wanted to be known as the wise people of the area. So there was a yeah. bit of witchcraft-based jealousy or <laughs> countrycraft-based jealousy, perhaps. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. You'd got all this stuff going on, as you say, with the magistrates who were wanting to get promoted mm. and, and get the big jobs down in London and yeah. earn land and all that and get the, get the notice of King James I. You'd yeah. got the, the ramifications of the fact that we'd got some of these people who were clearly practicing Catholics, as you say, mm. and it had only just happened after the, the whole gunpowder plot. So Catholicism was, was everywhere and, and hiding away yeah. in the shadow. So you had a lot of persecution going on there. And it clearly seems to have been some kind of religious persecution dressed up as witchcraft because... Yes. Yeah, it was, yeah. As you look, as you mentioned there about Alice and that beautiful statue that they've, they've recently built... I was. I first became aware of, of Alice Nutter when I read Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman's book Good Omens, because there's a character in that called Alice Nutter, and that's Neil Gaiman's later said that he based it entirely on her. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So it it it's one of those things that obviously now we've got this kind of paranormal hype about this whole story and this whole situation, and yet when you peel it all back, Craig, and look at the real situation, it's a heartbreaking story of just. Yeah of just persecution, misunderstanding, and people not really understanding what they were saying or doing, I think. Yeah, it, it's, it, it was definitely a lack of education um, that, that I think was the downfall. And also, you know, I mean, these, these people were suddenly thrust into the limelight. You know, they were suddenly the centre of attention. And, and for some of them, I think it was, it was a bit of an ego boost, really, because, as I say, you know, they were very, very poor people they were living on on the bread line you know in fact they were, they were probably living below what we would now say is the bread line and and i think i think to a certain degree a lot of it was um you know they were the center of attention they were they were taken up to lancaster they were put in court which was obviously full of people and everything and it must have been quite a quite a frightening experience for them but it's interesting you mentioned about the gunpowder plots actually because not, not many people know that when thomas potts wrote his book based on the based on the trials called The Wonderful Discovery of Witches. His first, the first edition of it was actually dedicated. He wrote the dedication to a, um, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Nivert. Ah. Thomas Nivert was credited with the capture of Guy Fawkes. Yeah. So there's an interesting link in there with what you said. So I think you're right. I think the religious persecution aspect is very strong in the story. Um, but just going back to, to sort of like how it's been um, manipulated is the word I like to use in, <laughs> in, in, into Pendle Hill being centre of paranormal activity. Yeah, we get a lot of, of ghost hunts. We get a lot of tourism in the area, which is fine. You know, I mean, it is a beautiful, beautiful place. The the hill itself is is quite a, a spectacular geological feature in itself. The um, the area around here is beautiful. It's it's wonderful countryside. Uh, there are some lovely little villages and towns. There's lots to do. Brilliant places to eat. Brilliant places to visit. And so the tourist industry is all very much alive and well. Um, and a lot of it is based around you know the tourism of the Pendle, which is which you know is 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 great for the area. There's actually more UFO activity goes on around Pendle Hill than, than there is paranormal <laughs> activity. The hill itself, you you will not see loads of ghosts running around and witches flying around. It just doesn't, <laughs> just doesn't happen. You yeah. will, however, see strange lights in the sky. And you know I. I think that over the centuries has actually helped to perpetrate the myths of the Pendle witches because, strangely enough, with with witchcraft, when when I mean people that are listening to to, to this podcast now will probably you know if I say what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of a witch, well I'll tell you now that it's somebody you know sat on a broomstick with a pointed hat flying through the sky, probably with a black cat as well, and all these. Uh, all this iconography, all these images are actually, they've, they've been, they've grown up around Hollywood more than mm. anything. Yeah. Snow White was, was the classic with the witch. You know, that's how we, we see a witch, the, the witch is Snow White. But when you think about going back through the centuries, I mean, obviously, you know, when, when the Pendle Witch trials were going on, it, it, it will have been well known. I mean, obviously, you know, we didn't have newspapers or the internet or anything like that. But, you know, news would have spread throughout the local villages of, of what was going on. And obviously, you know, the uh, the legend has, has grown over the years. And certainly sort of pre-1900, you know, before we started learning how to fly, if you lived in the area in, let's say, I don't know, 
1750 and you knew you'd been told by your parents and your grandparents about, you know, the legend of the Pendle Witches and, you know, 100 years ago these people were, um, you know, were tried for witchcraft and there's witchcraft in the area and everything else. And you happened to look up at the sky and you looked up towards Pendle Hill and you saw a light in the sky. The first thing you're going to think about, think that, it, that, it, that it, it's a witch on a broomstick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, there is evidence of, of these strange lights in this area, UFO sightings, going back to, to well before the turn of the 20th century. And so the whole area really is, has got an awful lot of, I wouldn't say paranormal activity, there is, because all the villages around the area, and you know, I've got stories from, from lots and lots of villages. I've got stories from, from Chapman, where I live. I've got stories from Clitheroe, which is the main market town very close by. Lots of paranormal stories, but there are also an awful lot of UFO sightings. And I think that, that sometimes strange lights in the sky and ghosts can actually go together if you don't understand that there is a separation between the two. And so I think the legend of the Pendle Witches has also been exacerbated, really, probably by a lot of sightings of strange lights in the sky over Pendle, which actually has nothing to do with witchcraft, nothing to do with the paranormal. It's more to do with UFOs, UAPs, and, and that sort of unexplained phenomena. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those areas as well, because obviously, as we were we were joking before we started the conversation properly, Craig, I'm I'm not too far from you. You know, we're just a, uh, as as the crow flies. It's probably about 30, 40 miles, really. Yeah, straight over. And it's very interesting how you've got this area of, of the Peak District and the Pennines, mm -hmm. which has seen I would probably say hundreds of alleged sightings of strange lights in the sky on both your side and our side. Yeah, you know, we've got some strange areas like in the Peak District. You've got the Dark Peak, which is infamous for the amount of plane wrecks that are still available to see up there, which is a, a terrifyingly spooky place, yeah. even in the day. Yeah. And there have been numerous recent, I mean, obviously the most famous proponent of, it, of all this area of the Pennines and the Peaks and, and your particular area is obviously Jenny Randalls, who's mm. collected hundreds of reports of these strange things. So, and it seems to go all the way along the border between our counties that we've got this kind of I don't know, it's it's like a magnet for strange things in the sky. Yeah, I mean, certainly the Pennines, the Pennine Hills, I think, are, I mean, it's a very atmospheric place, you know, especially when you're going over, um, you know, Saddleworth Moor from, mm. you know, from Manchester. I mean, we know that that's synonymous with, for all the wrong reasons. Yes. But, I mean, I, I, I've i looked at, at I've, I, I, I used, to sit, used to wonder why there are certain pockets of paranormal activity and why there's certain pockets of UFO activity and why there are places like Pendle Hill, like Rivington Pike near Bolton, um, like Morecambe Bay, like over the Pennines, Cate Moor near Skipton, why these areas have got either high instances of paranormal activity, high instances of, of UFO activity or a combination of the two. And when I started, I mean, again, it was, it, I'm glad you mentioned Jenny Rambles because I, I sort of looked at some of the stuff that she'd done and she started pushing me mentally in the, the, the direction of looking at the geology of an area mm. and looking at things like water courses. So have you got rivers running through? Because I, I've come across a lot of um, paranormal activity that are around rivers or natural water courses looking at the geology of places and then started looking at ley lines and looking where ley lines intersect. And the interesting thing is there are two main ley lines and I found these in various different sources. One runs north to south from Castle Rig Stone Circle up in the Lake District mm -hmm. down to uh, Beachy Head on the south coast. And then the one that runs from west to east or east to west, depending on which side of the Pennines you're on, uh, actually goes from Preston and it intersects the north-south one at Pendle Hill. And it then continues over the Pennines into Yorkshire, up through Harrogate, um, past a place called um, Menwith Hill, or Blubber Houses, as it's better known, <laughs> which is where, as you well know, there's um, uh, an American air base. It's an, uh, uh, an early warning system for possible nuclear attacks. Yep. And then that carries carries right on past uh, Filingdales, which is up on the North Yorkshire Moors, mm -hmm. which again is um, an early warning system, military installation. And then it intersects the northeast coast 
just in between, well, just sort of south of, of Whitby, um, sort of in between Whitby and Scarborough, which is up on that northeast coast area that, of course, Paul Sinclair has made infamous. Yep. So that whole area around there has obviously got an awful lot of very strange activity. And when you follow the lines, both north and south, and you look at various places on these lines, and you then look at the, the geology. So, for instance, Pendle Hill, the reason why it's a hill is because it's sandstone, whereas the area around here, uh, the lower lands, is all limestone. Mm. Now, I'm no geologist, but is there an interaction? Is there some sort of magnetic field? Is there some sort of interaction going on between, you know, these types of, of rocks which can concentrate, can bring in and concentrate energy? You mentioned the Peak District again different sort of geology to the area around it, is that bringing in energy? Is that concentrating energy? Again, we're looking at some sort of magnetic field. Jenny Randalls has done a lot of research into an area called uh, the Rosendale Valley, mm. which is just south of here, north of Manchester. Again, it's an area of, of compared to the area around it, the geology of that area is quite unique. And they get an awful lot of UFO uh, sightings going back dozens and dozens and dozens of years. So again, looking at the reason why we have these uh, pockets of paranormal activity or pockets of UFO activity, I'm a, I'm a very strong believer that it has to do with um, natural phenomena such as, as rivers, watercourses, um, and, and the geology and the makeup of the land. And, and you know, these concentrate energy and almost act as portals or doorways or, or something like that that helps bring this unexplained phenomena into where we are, if you know what I mean, into our realm. Mm, very much so. I mean, it, it's always interested me as well because it does seem to be, when you look at the, the UK, the whole Pennine Peak District area seems to be a real hot spot. And obviously, as you touched on there, with what's going on out on the East Coast as well, the work that Paul's done investigating those kind of places. I mean, they are really odd, like you mentioned Filingdales. It is such a strange thing because you are driving along the North York Moors and there's nothing around it, Craig, at all. Exactly. And that's all of, a seeing, all of a sudden you see this enormous white monolith just yes. stacking out like a sore thumb with nothing but more land around it. It's a very strange sight. And then there's a, <laughs> there's a, little, there's a really crappy little gate that says no entry. Yeah. Well, then there's no windows. There's no visible doors. Yeah, it's very odd. You can't you can't see any way in. You can't see any way out. Another good example is um, Morecambe Bay. Mm. Now, this is this is something that I researched for the second book, The Black Monks of Accrington. Now, Morecambe Bay. I don't know whether anybody's ever been there or, or you know know anything about it. But if you look on a map, you see it's a massive area of of tidal mudflats mm. the tide comes in and goes out twice a day so it, it fills up with water it goes out and then it fills up again it goes out with the tides and it, it's an area that, that is absolutely beautiful it's about 200 square miles of just mudflats and, and sand um, and it, you know I mean it's, it's a nature's paradise and, and there are lots of little villages dotted all around the, the, the coast uh, the river Kent um, flows into it at the, the north end. You've got Morecambe, which is, you know, a very faded sea, seaside town, mm. which is which is uh, on the southern parts of, of Morecambe. But then you've also got a nuclear power station at Heesham, mm. which is just to the south of Morecambe. And then when you follow Morecambe Bay around, again, people have a look at the map. You know, if you go on Google Maps and have a look while we're chatting about it, um, you'll see that over on the western side, you've got Barrow in Furness. Yeah. And I've done a lot of research into, um, you know, UFO activity. I've been contacted by uh, quite a few people. Uh, I was contacted by one guy who lived up at Barrow in Furness, um, used to do a lot of pleasure fishing, um, especially night fishing. And if you if you are stood looking out over the bay from uh, from Barrow in Furness or from Walney Island, which is where he was fishing from, um, and you're looking sort of southeast, you're looking across the bay towards Morecambe Bay on the far side and Heesham Power Station. Um, and he said, you know, many a time they used to see very strange lights over the over the bay. A lot of them used to um used to you know seem to be centered around Heesham Power Station um or around that area. And when I've I've gone back and looked through some of the reports of, of un unidentified craft in the area, um 
probably 95% of them are of a triangular nature. Mm -hmm. More than half of them are uh, a number of craft, not just necessarily one. And in fact, there was one occasion where there was something like, um, well, the report said that there was something upwards of about 30 or 40 of them um, in broad daylight over the um, over the bay, seen by any number of people. Um, so, you know, again, it, it's, it's the question of, well, you know, why is there so much activity in that area? Um, again, is it the geological makeup of the area? Is there something which is bringing these phenomena in? Because, you know, from the descriptions of how they're behaving and, and from the physical descriptions of them, and some of them are going back to the 1930s and, and even before then, you know, so we're not talking about you know, secret American spy planes, certainly not from the 1930s. There was nothing triangular that I know of that was flying around pre-Second World War. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, and, 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 you know, they are black triangular objects, you know, with, with lights along the bottom and, and you sort of classic archetypal triangular UFOs that actually I've been contacted by other people who've seen them in other areas as well. So they're not just, you know, sort of concentrated around Morecambe Bay, but this seems to be a concentration of them around Morecambe Bay. And it's really quite weird how going back over a hundred years, there's very clear reports, very clear witness statements to say that they've seen these objects and they all have, they all have the same makeup. They all look the same. They all behave the same. The question is, why are there so many being seen in that area? Is it something to do with the power station? Because it's, it's a nuclear power station. Um, in fact, there's two, Hesham 1 and Hesham 2. Just further up the coast, actually. So when you go, if you follow the coast around from Barrow and you head north up the Lake District coast, you come to Sellafield, which yeah. again is a very famous um, nuclear uh, facility. And again, there's a lot of UFO activity seen up around there. So is it these nuclear power facilities that, that are bringing them in? Just changing the subject completely or changing the area completely. If you go down to, to the southeast and you go down to Suffolk, mm -hmm. massive amount of UFO activity down there. You've got is it Sizewell? Sizewell B? Yep. Sizewell B. Massive amount of, um, of UFO activity down there. So again, you know, you've got to ask yourself, is it these nuclear power stations that, that these things are watching or that is, is acting as a magnet? Um, you know, it's very, very perplexing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, especially Malcolm Bay as well, because it's one of those areas, like you say, Craig, unless you, I think, unless you're from this far up north, uh, you don't really know much about it because I think probably Morecambe Bay is, because it, the way it runs round, and as you say, once you get past Blackpool, unless you're going to the Lake District, Morecambe is not somewhere a lot of people tend to go these days, sadly. No, it, it's just somewhere that, that, that you pass by on the M6. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you absolutely. Just, you just, I'd say Morecambe or Lancaster. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's an interesting place and, and they are, they are trying to do things. Yes. Uh, in fact, in fact, they're building a, an Eden project. They've just got plenty of permission to build an Eden project at Morecambe, oh. which is going to be interesting. So a carbon copy of the one that's down in Cornwall, but it's going to be more focused on the sort of uh, nature and, and marine life of, of Morecambe Bay because it is very rich in, in wildlife and certainly wild birds and, and you know, that sort of that sort of thing. So, so yeah, that's that's you know they are trying to do things to it, and it is a beautiful place to go and visit. You know, I mean, there is nothing better than looking out over Morecambe Bay on a nice summer's evening and what and watching the sun yeah. set. It is it is absolutely uh, amazing. But yeah, it's not the sort of place really where most most people would visit um, if you didn't know the area. But you know, it is rich in in certainly UFO activity, and I've got no doubt there's a lot of paranormal activity in the area as well. And that's perhaps something that I'd I'd look at, you know, investigating in the future, um, because I'm sure there is. And I think as well, as you were referring to there about the amount of sightings as well, you know, you're only a stone's throw away from the Lake District, which is once again, vast expanses of water, strange geological formations. Maybe they're just coming in that way because it's the quickest way to get into the Lake District. Yeah, very possibly. Yeah. <clears throat> there are, I mean, again doing some digging, um, doing some research. There, there have been you know, numerous um, strange uh, sightings over the Lake District, um, even up as far as Keswick, um, over Coniston, down to Windermere. You know, there have been a lot of, of 
strange UAP sightings. I think it's probably about the best way to describe them over the years. And again, you know, we're going back dozens of years, we're going back pre-war. So, so yeah, it's a very interesting area, the whole area around there. Bringing it back to the paranormal then, Craig, I know obviously there are some fabulous witness encounters in the book, but obviously one of the best encounters I've heard you discuss is, is your first real sort of spooky encounter which was when you were a, a young lad working behind the bar at your local conservative club. What happened here? Because this, what I found this interesting as well, Craig, and I've spoken with a couple of people about this. I, was, I spoke to Malcolm Robinson recently talking about shadow men and hat men being something that didn't seem to be really reported in British paranormal literature until no. sort of the last 10 years. And we were kind of saying, well, we think it's probably always gone on but yeah. people just didn't have a, a frame of reference to use it. No, this is going back, oh, this is going back over 30 years, 30, 35 years. I think really the the, the phrase shadow man or, or hat man was, was first coined by Art Bell um, on his coast to coast um, radio show. I think, I think he was the first one really to sort of hang a, a description on, on these things. But yeah. certainly, um, certainly, you know, when you start looking back again through evidence and then you start looking back at reports, they've been seen by people um, from all over the world for for many, many years, going back again, dozens, maybe maybe even hundreds of years. Mm. At the time when I saw it, the the the, the description shadow man or, or hat man um, hadn't been used. And it was only um, recently... Uh, and in fact, it was this actually that prompted me to write the first book. I was listening to um, to a podcast. I think it was one of Howard Hughes's podcasts. Uh, and he was talking to a guy about shadow people. Mm. And it just resonated with me from what I'd seen back back in the late 80s. And it was a very strange experience. I was, Dacrington Conservative Club um, is no longer there. It, um, it burned down, actually, it was... It was a victim of arson a few years ago now, probably about 10 years ago. It was it was built late 1800s, so 1898, I think. Very gothic in style, built over three floors with a, with a cellar. It was a, a private club, although they used to do um, sort of wedding parties and, you know, birthday parties and, and that sort of thing in, uh, in function rooms. And there was also... Um, on the third floor, there was a, a, a huge ballroom, mm. rivaled only really by the one at Blackpool Tower, which yeah. is the, the famous one. And it, it was a very strange place. It always felt quite strange. And on this particular evening, I was actually, it was a midweek and I was working in the, um, in the ground floor bar, which was the members bar. And it was, uh, at the end of the bar, there was a sort of serving hatch, uh, a waist high serving hatch that, that led through into uh, the snooker room uh, and that had three full-size uh, 12 by six foot snooker tables in there so you can get a sort of sense of scale of, of how big the room was and of course you know this serving hatch was, was where these you know people who were playing snooker and guys who were playing snooker used to go and get a drink you know yeah i was uh, stood behind the bar one evening it was getting very close to, to closing time this is back in the days when we used to you know Calls up at about half past 10, 10 o'clock, half past 10. <laughs> yeah. uh, midweek, you know, members club. I think we had about two people and they both had half a mile and that was about it. <laughs> so I was, I was particularly bored. Uh, there was nobody in the snooker room playing snooker at all. Um, this was the day before, the days before mobile phones. So I couldn't even, you know, flick through Facebook or whatever. Um, so I was just idly sort of shuffling around behind the bar, you know, waiting for um, to be able to close up. And the only other person that, that was in the club at the time was the steward uh, of the club, a uh, full-time steward, a guy called Bernard. And uh, he was upstairs on the third floor, stocking the bar. Anyway, I was stood um, with my back uh, to the to the back of the bar, so the serving hatch was, was to my left. Um, and all of a sudden, I became aware that something was stood in the serving hatch, and... For a split second, I thought, oh, somebody's coming through the side door and they're wanting a drink. And as I was thinking this, I turned to have a look and took a sort of step forward and stopped because in the serving hatch, there was, on the other side of the bar, there was this figure that was very tall, thin, dark, 
sort of slightly see-through, slightly opaque figure, very thin, very tall. And the thing that I remember about it was that it was wearing a hat. And it was almost like, um, the best way that I can describe it, it was like a sort of fedora type hat. And it, it was very tall, but it was leaning forward and it was leaning through the, the hatch. The hatch was probably about, I don't know, maybe four foot by four foot, something mm. like that. And it was waist height. Yeah. But it, it, I could see it had its hands on either side of the bar. And it was leaning through like it was looking over the bar at something. I couldn't see any facial features. There were no features of clothing or anything like that. It was just like um, a sort of, you know, very semi-opaque shadow. But I could definitely make out the shape. And it, it was there for maybe five or six seconds, long enough for me to, to be able to register it, long enough for me to think, what the flipping heck's that? <laughs> long enough to be quite shocked by what I'd seen. And then all of a sudden, it just disappeared. Now, at the time, I was probably about 18 or 19, so I was a little bit too cocky, a little bit too, um, you know, too sure for me on boots. But this really shook me up. I remember feeling very, very shaken. Um, and we used to have, as I said, day before, the, the days before uh, mobile phones. So we used to have an internal phone system. And I, I, I grabbed the phone and dialed the ballroom upstairs, knowing that, that Bernard was up there. And he answered the phone. And then I said, can you calm down something? Really strange has just happened. So he said, yeah, I'll be down in a minute. So literally about 30 seconds later, he, the door opens and he, he walks into the bar. And the first thing he said to me without me saying anything was he looked at me and he said, you look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> and I said, well, strangely enough, I have. And he said, oh, you've seen it as well, have you? Oh. So, of course, this made me stop to look, and look at him and he stopped and looked at me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it's like a very tall, thin, shadowy type thing, isn't it? And I said, yeah. I said it was in, in, the, in the snooker room, the serving act. He said, yeah, I've seen it as well. Um, and he said, quite a few people who've work, worked in the club over the years have seen it. Uh, he said, most of them have, have put the coat on and never come back. <laughs> um, he said, a few people, you know, a few customers over the years have seen it um, or had, you know, strange feelings of a presence when they've been in the snooker room playing snooker on their own or whatever. So yeah, he he was he was absolutely um, yeah wasn't shocked at all. Just just said yeah, it's been seen quite a few times, and that stuck with me really for well, it's stuck with me ever since. You know, which is a which is a number of years. But interestingly, just just moving away from that a little bit, less than about a quarter of a mile away, there is um, a road called uh, Warner Street in Accrington. Mm. And Warner Street is probably one of the most haunted streets that I know of, of any town uh, that I've ever come across anywhere in the country. There have been numerous reports of um, quite threatening, I think it's probably the word, poltergeist activity in a number of properties that, that it's basically um, a, a road which has got rows of shops either side. They're not um, residential houses or anything like that. Dates back to about 1821, it used to be a turnpike road by all accounts. Well, this particular, there's one particular shop that a lot of um, paranormal investigations have been done over the years. And um, Probably about 12 months ago, I interviewed um, a lady who was a paranormal investigator who had been in and done an investigation in, into this shop in Warner Street. Um, and there was a particularly violent poltergeist um, or entity. Actually, it was actually, it was described as a man with a hat, <laughs> which is interesting because it's not that far away from where I saw the man with the hat. <sighs> But this poltergeist is he's quite uh, quite violent. Uh, it actually shoved uh, her husband down the stairs, physically shoved him down the stairs when when they were in there. And again, I did some research. Um, turns out that back in the nineteenth century, there was actually a murder uh, in the shop. The um, a lady was uh, uh, called Sarah Coates was uh, stabbed to death. There was a young boy who was tried and found guilty uh, because he was found, well, he actually raised the alarm, but he, he, he was covered in blood. He had blood all over his hands. Yeah. And he was accused of, of actually um, stabbing her. But he maintained all along that there was a man in the room when he found the body and that this man uh, was a very tall, thin man wearing a hat with a big moustache and he said he had a knife in his hand. And when, uh, when the young boy 
went to, walked into the room and found this scene. This man ran out of the back of the shop and disappeared. Um, and actually, during the um, during the trial, which incidentally was was at Lancaster again, <laughs> late late nineteenth century, there was an anonymous letter received by the court during the trial from somebody who claimed that they had been in a, a public house in Bolton, of all places. So Bolton's a town just on the north west side of Manchester, mm. probably about 30 miles from here. And um, the anonymous letter said that this person had been uh, in a public house and that there had been a very strange looking man who was very tall with a big moustache, who was very drunk this one particular evening. And he'd been telling everybody that he had committed a murder in Accrington, that he'd stabbed a woman. And th the day after... Um, a body was found on the uh, the railway lines in the centre of, of Bolton. This particular individual had been hit and killed by a train. Mm. And the body was described as being, he, he was very tall, thin, with a, a big moustache. And he had, a, he had a hat with him. So, uh, unfortunately for uh, the young lad who was being tried for the murder, uh, the jury didn't believe this anonymous letter and they did find him guilty. Um, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Um, he wasn't sentenced to, to execution, as it was normal in those days. Um, and then he sort of disappears into history. We don't really know what happened to him um, after that. He was called Christopher Hindle. However, the poltergeist, the, this man with the hat and the big moustache, um, according to the medium, the lady who investigated um, the property, called himself Josiah. And she said he was, um, he was quite a violent individual. Um, so I think... You know, putting two and two together, he was probably um, the man who was responsible for the murder and he still uh, frequents the, the place where this murder took place, even though he was, you know, killed in a in a different location. I think he's probably sort of dragged back to the scene of the crime. Um, and he would seem to be quite a, quite a violent um, entity. And, you know, I often wonder... Uh, whether or not it was the same entity that I saw all those years ago, not too far away from Warner Street on uh, on Cannon Street in the Conservative Club. Mm. So is this figure or all the other properties that are located next door to where this poltergeist inhabits, Craig? Are, mm. what, are they are they similar kind of incidents that are going on? Similar kind of experiences? Is it are they poltergeist manifestations or are they having? Paranormal incidents were of a slightly different nature. No, it's paranormal incidents, but they're slightly different. One, one of the ones that, that Christopher Hindle's actually seen running across the road, uh, because where the where the murder took place across the road was where where Sarah Court's husband had a joinery business, and in fact Christopher Hindle was his apprentice. Mm. And Christopher Hindle's ghost is often seen running from the scene of the murder across Warner Street, across the road, into a property on the opposite side of the road um, where, the, uh, where the joinery business was. And I've actually looked at um, the 1891 census records um, and found the the, the relative um, properties, the one, you know, the one where, the, um, uh, where the Courts family lived. Um, and Chris Findle's actually on the census as an apprentice. So it all ties in. Yeah, the the hat man, the the tall figure with the big moustache, the nasty poltergeist, only seems to be centred around this one particular property. But there have been, um, you know, investigations done into some of the other shops on Warner Street around that particular property. So you know, maybe next door or two or three shops further around. And there is actually um, a Victorian arcade, which is. Um, uh, situated at the bottom of Warner Street, and it's actually—I mean, it's a, you know—it is it dates back to about 1880, I think, something like that. Mm. And there's, there's also um, reports of you know quite strange things going on around there as well, um, sort of um, your classic you know bangings, knockings, footsteps in various um, uh, you know various properties within that arcade. So the whole area seems to be quite. Quite high in paranormal activity, but the one that, that is is the real focus is is this particular shop where the body of of Sarah Courts was found. Yeah, I mean, it is. I always find that very interesting because there are a couple of places I've heard of. I think there's one further down south, might be in 
in Bedfordshire, where there's a very similar thing where you've got five or six houses, uh, five or six properties and, and businesses, Craig, where they all seem to be connected on the top, like sort of attic. Room. Yeah. And every every property seems to be having footsteps and bangings and knockings, and it seems to sort of move up and down different properties depending on the time of year or whatever. So yeah. I always like those kinds of things because it, it seems really interesting because you don't get these very often where you have a haunted street. But then again, it seems that Accrington, you've got another street, which is, is it Abbey Street, where there's also a lot of strange things going on? Well, there is. I mean, Abbey Street is named after an abbey, um, which was uh, originally there built 12th century, so about 1136, something mm-hmm. like that. There was an abbey built by some of the uh, the, the monks from Kirkstall Abbey in Leeds. They were given some lands on which on, on the site so that is now Abbey Street. I mean, obviously, you know, the town of Accrington didn't exist at the time. Um, but there's, there's a natural river, the River Hindburn, which which runs through, and they built, they were given lands next to the river, and, and they built the abbey on there. The area around it was mainly just farmland and, you know, you had a few farmers and, um, you know, a few little sort of, you know, communities of, of, of that size. And what happened was the the local farmers were not happy that the uh, monks who inhabited the abbey were basically taking the lands off them to, to farm themselves and to cultivate and to keep, keep the animals on. Um, and it all came to a bit of a head and the local farmers actually burnt the abbey down, <laughs> set fire to it, burnt it down. Hence the name Black Abbey Street, which is the actual street. There's Abbey Street and Black Abbey Street. Uh, and it's actually Black Abbey Street that the, uh, the abbey used to be on. Mm. Um, and black, obviously, because, you know, the, the blackened charred remains of the abbey. Unfortunately, there were also the blackened charred remains of three monks. No. Oh. That they discovered inside the abbey once the the flames had gone out, and so there are a number of um, paranormal sightings, a number of ghost sightings. The black monks are seen across quite a wide range of area. Actually, I've had contact from a from a guy who uh, saw a monk stood on the disused railway line, which is quite close to where. Uh, Black Abbey Street is situated. Um, he was walking along the uh, the disused railway line one morning, going to work. So he always used to take the same uh, the same route. Uh, so on this particular morning, he was walking along and he noticed there was a figure in the distance um, very early in the morning. Uh, and as, as he got closer to it, he, he said it was strange. It seemed to be wearing a hood and a sort of long flowing uh, garment that he said as he got closer... With a little bit of prompting from me, I said, do you think it could have been a, a monk's habit and a cowl? And he said, I actually thinking about it. He said, yeah, it did look very much like that. Mm. And he said, he, he, you know, this figure was uh, was facing him, but he said there was, he couldn't see a face or anything like that. It was just, you know, sort of black emptiness where, where, where the face should be. Um, and so, so he said that was quite, that made him jump a little bit, as you can imagine. <laughs> and they've also been seen uh, in the... Um, it's the, 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 they're actually not used now. There's um, a police station and the magistrate's court, which again is is sort of in that general area of um, of Black Abbey Street. So no doubt, historically, the lands were there now built. They date back to the 1930s. But historically, there will have been lands that probably the monks would have farmed or used for, you know, for, for whatever purpose they, they wanted. These buildings can't be knocked down because the the Grade Two listed buildings. So there have actually been some local ghost groups uh, have gone in and done vigils and overnights and all that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of the stuff that, that they've again, I've interviewed uh, somebody who you know was very much involved in these. And a lot of the stuff is quite generic stuff, you know, footsteps and all and all that sort of thing. Um, but there have been sightings of of monks within these buildings. Um, but the, there was also an incident where a number of them actually got locked inside a cell in one of the old cells <laughs> in the police station. And, and he, he said, I, and actually it made the local newspapers because they had to call the fire brigade out to come and actually cut them out because the door locked, but it locked in such a way that they couldn't unlock it from, from the outside or from the inside. Um, and, and in fact, it shouldn't have been able to lock because they didn't have a key. There wasn't because they were being safe. Obviously, you know, they didn't, they didn't want people, they didn't want people to be trapped inside, <laughs> yes. inside the cell, but it turned out they were, yeah. and they couldn't work out why it had happened, you know. Um, so that sort of hit the local press, you know, it was very sensationalised. Um, 
headline in the in the local newspaper. But there's also there's there's the story of um, a young girl as well. Now this this is a story actually that goes way back into my youth. It was whenever anybody used used to mention Black Abbey Street, even as a child, the first thing that that would pop into my mind was was the ghost of, of this young girl that's often seen, but she's mm. been seen many many times um, going back you know many many years um, floating down. Black Abbey Street, you know, wringing her hands and wailing. They call her the Wailing Woman, um, crying and screaming and, and, and in a real state of emotional distress. Um, and the story is that she actually did fall in love with one of the monks. It's a classic sort of love story. She fell in fell in love with one of the monks and um, her brother and his friends found out and they actually killed the monk in front of her and, and she fell into uh, fits of, of, of remorse and, and everything else and, and she died of a broken heart. But the interesting thing about that sighting is that she's often described as, as you get closer to her, as you actually get close to this figure, she actually bursts into flames. So... It's interesting as to whether this is something that, that the story itself is probably true. You know, I've, I've spoken to many people who, who know about the, the story of, of the white lady, the wailing lady of, of Black Abbey Street. Mm. But the interesting thing about bursting into flames, because that doesn't really ring true, it's more linked to the, um, to the abbey burning down rather than to the legend of the, of the young girl who died of a broken heart because her brother killed a black monk boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's, that's quite an interesting story. But, but yeah, I mean, that's that's a very well-known story within the town. So, But again, just going back to what we were talking about before, you see, because there's a natural water course that runs through there and it actually runs under Warner Street. So not only does it run mm-hmm. Warner Street, but it also runs down past where the Abbey used to be. And this is the area that's sort of like, you know, got an awful lot of um, paranormal activity. So... It's interesting because when you think about it, water is is obviously a natural conduit for for energy. There's a lot of energy in water. It's especially running water. It's it's very active. Yeah, and you know, as human beings, we are what ninety five percent water anyway ourselves. Mm. And sometimes I wonder, are we connecting in with the natural world in such a way that we can see these things? Um, you know, are we are some people on on the right frequency as it were to be able to to see and experience these things um and whereas some people are perhaps not quite tuned in in the same way are we drawn to to sort of natural water courses is that why you know we see a lot of paranormal activity around these sort of areas um so yeah lots of unanswered questions <laughs> very much so it is interesting i'm you know i'm very open minded when it comes to that kind of connection between water and, and paranormal activity. And it does seem like you say that often running water, as you say, is is deceptively powerful. Mm. And it is very interesting how you will often get a spike in, in certain paranormal events or, or occurrences where there are water courses or hidden rivers or ponds or, or locks or lakes, Craig, that seems yeah. to give it some kind of energy and, it, and something in the environment reacts to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, like I say, we've got a natural water course which runs through the village. There's lots and lots of um, stories of, of paranormal activity based in and around the village where I live. This natural water course actually runs from the top of Pendle Hill, so it comes down Pendle. Mm. It passes through some uh, some allotments, which, again, there's a story in the second book, The Black Monks of Accrington. Um, local guy told me a story about, you know, some very strange activity that he'd witnessed on this allotment site near to where this, this natural stream runs runs through. He'd seen some some very strange, uh, what he could only describe as paranormal activity in that area. And again, further down, as, as you follow the stream down to where it goes into the River Ribble, again, you know, you're going past where the um, where Victoria Mill used to be. And again, like I mentioned before, the story of the ghost and everything else. So yeah, it, it's. I'm not saying that that you get paranormal activity everywhere where there is. A natural water course or where there's natural running water but i mean a lot of legends for instance um you know a lot of folklore tends to grow up around for instance going way back to when i was telling you right at the beginning about my granddad he used to tell me stories about the leeds liverpool canal you know there was a, there was um a sort of ghostly troll-like goblin that used to live under the swing bridge 
and whether that was to stop me going near the canal and falling in. Yeah. But, but again, it's how these local legends grow up. You know, I'm sure that, that the seed of it somewhere along along the line is, is actually true. Yeah. That perhaps something was seen there at some point. Um, and, you know, it's just grown up and 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 grown up into a local legend that, that people tell each other. But yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, more can bear, for instance, massive area of water. North East Coast where Paul Sinclair is, it's out in the sea. You see a lot of stuff out in the sea. Mm. Not only is the, the geology a, a factor, but I also think that natural water courses and ley lines, and I think it all, all sort of melds together and it all points to bringing this energy in, bringing these, uh, this paranormal activity and then the UFOs and UAPs and it all concentrates in and it's a factor of many, many things. Mm. It's intriguing, isn't it? It really is. Very interesting. It is. The more you look into it and the more I've looked into it, the more... See, I mean, if you'd have asked me two years ago, Craig, do you believe in ley lines? I'd have said, nah, a lot of old rubbish. A <laughs> lot, lot, lot of old tree-hugging rubbish. But I think it is. The more the more research I do, there, you know, there is... I think there is definitely something in it. Yeah. Well, ironically, talking about ley lines, the last venue I want to sort of dive into is... One of the stories in the second book that really made me smile, I don't know why, but Mandy Paul owns a haunted ice cream shop, Craig, <laughs> in Chatburn. She does indeed. No, it's real, honestly, Mandy's fantastic. Mandy is, is somebody that everybody should meet um, and talk to because she's, she's, a, she's a medium. She have, the, the, the really weird thing is I've known her for an awful long time. Let's we'll start off with the ice cream shop, okay? So the ice cream shop is called Hudson's Ice Cream Shop, and it is famous in the area. She makes her own ice creams. They are fantastic. Um, and people flock, especially during, during the summer, for miles around. It's a real uh, magnet for day trippers. Um, they come along, they buy the ice creams, sit outside, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. The, the actual shop itself um, is the old toll house, it's the old toll booth on, on two sort of main roads that run through the centre of, uh, of the village. And actually on the side of um, the side of, of the front of the shop, you, you can see the old um, toll charges. It, yeah. It's, you know, it's listed in, in a, on, the, on, a, on a plaque. Now, I've known Mandy for, for many, many years when my, my son was um, going to the local primary school. Um, we always used to offer an ice cream when I picked him up. Um, his grandma, who sadly is no longer with us, when she used to pick him up, used, used to take him for an ice cream um, after school. And like I said, I've known Mandy for years. And it was only literally within the last six months that I discovered that she's a medium. She uh, conducts out-of-body experiences. Uh, she's also a, a remote viewer. Fascinating lady, and people can actually listen to an interview I did with her on uh, on my podcast. Um, and I urge I urge everybody to have a listen to it because she is fascinating. But yeah, it's haunted. She has an, a haunted ice cream shop. It's actually the ghost of a lady called Sarah Hudson who passed away not not too many years ago, by all accounts. Uh, but she had bought the shop in the nineteen thirties, um, and she was the first. Uh, the first person to actually make ice cream there. So, so when Mandy took the shop over, she uh, she decided to, to carry on the the practice of uh, making and selling ice cream, amongst other things. But yeah, she um, she's visited on a regular basis by uh, by Sarah Hudson, who who makes herself known. She still makes herself known by standing behind the counter um, at the front of the shop. Uh, with her arms folded, as Mandy says, um, watching over her to make sure that she's, uh, you know, not measuring out the meat wrong or, you know, the, um, <laughs> the slices of ham, you know, making sure that, that, that she's not uh, diddling the customers and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> and, yeah, she's uh, she's seen throughout that it's, it, it, it is quite an old, it's an old property um, and it's got a cellar and she's often seen down in the cellar as well, just sort of really probably going about what she would go about in life, up and down the stairs, and and you know into the back back of the shop where uh, where the family live, um, and just generally makes herself known that she's still around. Um, and uh, uh, creepily, her, her her brother, uh, this is um, uh, Sarah Hudson's brother when he was alive, um, used to make coffins and they used to store them down in the cellar. <laughs> 
of the uh, of the shop. And across the road is a pub called the Black Bull. And in the cellar of the Black Bull, um, there used to be slabs. Well, the house of slabs are still there, but obviously they're now not not used for their intended purpose, which was for laying out dead bodies. And um, because <laughs> because it was cold yeah. down there. Um, and, you know, they used to last a little bit longer. So the the story is that um, Sarah Hudson's uh, brother used to make the coffins and then they used to carry them across the road down into the cellar of the Black Bull and, you know, deposit the bodies and then take them to wherever they were taking them to. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's quite, uh, quite an interesting story. But, yeah, uh, she's a fascinating lady. She really is. And it was probably one of the best podcasts I've ever done, actually. Mm. Really interesting. Some, you know, really, really interesting stories. But, yeah, it, it sort of brings a new dimension because I, I, I visit the shop all the time. Um it's literally, you know, about two minutes walk from where I live. Mm. And, you know, whenever I'm walking past, I always give her a wave and I always pop in, you know. Um, and I always look behind the counter just to see if I can spot Sarah in a white apron, you know, keeping an eye on things. But apparently she's very, she's very benevolent, apparently. She doesn't, doesn't cause any, there's, you know, it's, there's not poltergeist activity. She doesn't throw things or anything like that. But she's, she's definitely still around. Yeah. Mandy says that, um, obviously, she'd had this encounter, and then I think she bumped into Sarah's niece and thought, "My God, she looks familiar." Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said she that she obviously to to honour the history of the of the shop because obviously it, it became such a a well known location and and mm-hmm. very traditional and and much loved by the residents. Great. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. She thought she'd put a photo up, and apparently that. Was the kickoff for, for Sarah coming back more regularly, wasn't it? Yeah, she said once she she, she actually managed to um, to get hold of a, a black and white photograph and she framed it and and hung it up in the front of the shop, and she said um, once she'd done that, then the uh, the instances of her being aware that Sarah was around became more frequent, and she said uh, more than more than one occasion the um, the photos just fallen off the wall. For no, apparent, no apparent reason. The you know the nail that it's on is still intact. It's just fallen off the wall. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fabulous! So it, it, it certainly makes you a bit more aware when you go into you know buy an ice cream or <laughs> what, what have you. you know, the, the, could, there could be somebody uh, watching over as as you as you buy in your raspberry ripple. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous. Fabulous. Well, Craig, it's been wonderful to to have a real good conversation with you about some of these wonderful locations and stories and your research and your work. Where can everybody keep up to date with it, get a copy of the book and listen to your podcast and anything else? Okay. um, Probably the the, the best place to go for everything is uh, my website, which is uh, www.craigbryant.co.uk. So the links to both the books, uh, the links will take you to Amazon. So you can buy the books on Amazon. They're on Kindle. Um, they're also on Kindle Unlimited. So if you, have, if you have Kindle Unlimited, then they won't even cost you a penny. You can just read them for nothing. And also, there's also a link on there as well to my podcast, which is called Paranormal Pendle Podcast. Um, I haven't got quite the number under my belt that uh, that you've got with your podcast, but um, I'll, you know, I'll get there eventually. Um, I'm on to about number 25, I think, at the minute. So, but yeah, I've had some really interesting guests on there. I've spoken to some great people from from all areas of, of the unexplained. So from paranormal to uh, cryptozoology to um, UAPs and UFOs, Paul, you know, Paul Sinclair. Debbie Hatswell, people like that, you know, sort of quite quite well known people within their respective fields. So, so yeah, probably the best place to go to is my website. Um, you can drop me a, an email through the website as well. I will reply to any emails if anybody wants to send, send me any stories. Um, I am more than than happy to to receive your stories. Um, and if anybody just wants to drop me a line for a chat, um, quite happy to have a chat and uh, and just uh, yeah, explore explore anything that's uh, that's weird or wonderful or unexplained. Oh, well, fantastic. And as I said during the conversation, it's brilliant to see these collections being brought out in the modern era, Craig. So long may they continue. I look forward to your next collection because no doubt this is often the situation in stories like this where once you start, you'll suddenly find that you can't stop and the stories just keep flying into your email, no doubt. Well, I'm all yeah. I'm hoping to um, to go off on a slightly different route for the next book. I've got an idea for for uh, for another book, 
Um, I'm keeping it under wraps at the minute. It's just floating around in my head as we speak. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's a little bit more, um, all I'll say, it's more focused on uh, on water, strangely enough. Mm, fantastic. Well, I look forward to that and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about it when it gets released. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's been great. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. You take care and all the very best, Craig. Thank you. Thank you, and you. Thank you. Thank you.